Number 1. For several years scientists thought that the eternal flame in New York was kept ablaze by gas generated by ancient rocks that are extremely hot. However, Indiana University researchers found that the rocks beneath are not hot enough to create this gas, which implies that something else keeps the flame alight. They are unable to discover the real reason behind such a phenomenon. The eternal flame is located behind a waterfall in western New York. According to the Native Americans, it is being lit for thousands of years. There are hundreds of other eternal flames across the world. And the scientist assumed that the fire is due to natural gas generated from the rock underneath. Arndt Schimmelman and examiners from Indian University found that rocks underneath the fire in New York are not hot enough to generate such an outcome. Schimmelman further stated that according to him, there's a different way of gas production in that particular location. He added, saying, and if there is indeed another path of gas production, there might be more shale gas sources than anticipation. The temperature of the flame is said to be hotter than the boiling point of water. Collapse the carbon molecules in the shale. This consequence produces natural gas. Eternal Flame Falls Trail History The eternal flame was almost an unknown attraction. However, media coverage and development to the access trail have increased no of tourists and visitors. The augmented popularity of the eternal flame falls led to some adverse effects, such as wreckage, increase in litter, pollution, and effects on the surrounding environment by tourists. However, it incited a public campaign against a proposal to eliminate a nearby jungle to build a disc golf course in 2012. As you come close to the eternal flame falls, you would get a smell of a rotten egg. That is the smell of natural gas produces amongst the shale layers. The eternal flame underneath the Chestnut Bridge County Park is alive due to the consistent quantity of methane gas. It was believed that the flame has once gone out, however, it immediately lit again. According to folklore, the eternal flame first set on fire a hundred years ago. As per Atlas Obscure, this natural event has developed some ingenious stories of elves in the area. However, it is highly unlikely to encounter one. It would still be a good idea to be careful of your safety. Due to soil erosion, it has made the ground thick and with roots likely to slip a hiker. Rainfall could make the passage slippery and dangerous. You could glare as much as you could into the flame, however, be careful about your safety, as well. Eternal flames fall is highly contingent on meltwater and rainfall. It is generally flowing in early spring. The eternal flame is one of the most exclusive waterfalls in the whole country and one of the few natural landscapes we could find on our planet. Number 2 the Crooked Forest is a grove of 400 oddly shaped pine trees located near the town of Grafino, West Pomerania in Poland. The pine trees were planted around 1930, when its location was still within the German province of Pomerania. From the base, the pine trees grow with a 90-degree sharp bend northward, but then curve back to grow straight up into the sky. Despite the unnatural curves bending 3 to 9 feet sideways at their bases, these trees are generally healthy and grow up to 50 feet tall. There are many theories on the mystery, although there is little to no evidence to support any of them. Some hypothesize that a unique gravitational pull in this particular area caused the trees to grow curved northwards, but this theory does not hold up to basic scientific scrutiny given that gravity pulls things downward and not at a curve. Others guessed that the heavy snowfall in the area weighed down the trees as they were sprouting, causing them to grow crookedly at the base, but this theory does not explain why other groups of pine trees and assorted vegetation in the same area were not affected. Some suspect that the trees were grown for the rims of wooden cartwheels as the grain direction would have produced very tough wheels. The most widespread and most likely explanation is that local farmers planted and manipulated the trees when they planted them in 1930, but it is estimated that the trees were 7 to 10 years old when they experienced the force that resulted in trunk curvature. When they experienced the force that resulted in trunk curvature. Were the trees intentionally altered local farmers? Did the trees naturally bend northwards? Many people have been trying to find an answer to this mystery, 
But since the town of Graffino was largely abandoned between the early stages of World War II until the 1970s, the people who were there before the war, and probably had the answer to the mystery of the crooked forest are now likely gone forever. Number 3 Nestled deep within the Sanger de Cristo mountain range is Taos, New Mexico. Home of the Tiwa Indians and the old Taos Pueblo, it is one of the longest continually inhabited communities in the United States. A highly cultural, artistic, and spiritual city, it has a number of mystical qualities, one of which is known as the Taos hum. In recent decades, studies have explored this low-frequency humming sound, and a variety of explanations have been offered ranging from secret experiments in Los Alamos, New Mexico, top-secret military flight activity, electromagnetic vibrations emitted by Taos Mountain, or even low-flying alien spacecraft over the night skies. Not everyone can hear the mountain song, in fact, only about 2% of the population can pick up this strange audio phenomenon. But, hear it they do, today, and far back into history. Ancient lore of the area tells of nature holding counsel with her own, and as she sings she resets her patterns of harmony. Looming out of the Taos mountain range is a peak known as El Salto. It was this peak, which was reflecting the scarlet colors of the setting sun, that caused the first settlers in the valley to name the entire range Sanger de Cristo, the blood of Christ. This majestic peak has seven waterfalls that cascade down its site in summer and form giant ice sculptures in the winter. For generations, the people of the area have considered El Salto to be a holy mountain that baptizes the valley with its singing waters. Behind many of the waterfalls are caves of different shapes along the various elevations of El Salto Peak. These caves will catch the sounds of the cascading waterfalls and echo them across the valley. In the mid-1800s, the famous healer, holy man, and hermit, Giovanni Maria Agostini Giustiniani, passed through the area and climbed all the way to the top of El Salto. He would write in his journal that he had heard the singing waters of the sacred mountain. He described that he had distinctly heard seven notes of the musical scale as nature played her tune on the holy mountain. Mountain climbers today continue to describe hearing a long, endless musical tone which changes as they climb upward. Is this the source of the famous Taos hum? Many people who can hear it describe feeling blessed and comforted by the low-frequency noise. But, others do not have such a pleasant experience. Some tell of hearing a low rumbling or buzzing sound, while others describe it as sounding like a distant diesel engine. In many of these cases, people who have heard it also say that the sound is maddening, drives them crazy, and interferes with their sleep. More severe complaints also included pressure on the ears, headaches, and nosebleeds. Of those who complain of the constant humming noise, they also say that it does not sound like a natural phenomenon, often starts abruptly, and heard more after sunset and in the middle of the night than during the day. In 1993, several of these folks banded together and petitioned Congress to investigate the noise. Four years later, the politicians responded by sending a team of a dozen investigators and scientists from some of the most prestigious research institutes in the nation to look into the strange low-frequency noise. Some of the facilities involved in the investigation included the University of New Mexico, Sandia National Laboratories, Phillips Air Force Laboratory, and the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Despite all of the knowledge and technology of the scientific experts, they were unable to find the source of the noise. The hum is not detectable by microphones or VLF antennae, leading many to believe that it is not a man-made sound, but, rather, just one more of Mother Nature's mysteries. One theory given was that it might be caused by shifting wind patterns coming out of the Rio Grande Canyon. Yet others blame the noise on more modern causes such as electromagnetic background buildup or military communication systems. Taos is not alone with its hum. Other places around the world have also reported the same phenomenon in Bristol, England, Bondi, New South Wales, Australia, and on the Big Island of Hawaii. New Zealand has the Auckland hum and in Indiana, people hear what is known as the Kokomo hum. For those who want to hear the hum, it is suggested to get out of the city of Taos into the surrounding deserts or forests. Early morning or at night are the best times to hear the hum. Some who have heard the hum say that it can be heard best near Tres Orejas, west of Taos. 
For those looking for the beauty and adventure of the El Salto waterfalls, they are located about seven miles north of Taos, on private land. They can be visited with a permit. Number 4 one frosty winter day in the northern wilds of Iceland, a young lad was sent by his mother to help out at the next farm. But darkness fell, a blizzard raged, and the poor lad got lost. Cold, hungry and tired, he came across a little house, knocked on the door, and a kindly, but short, couple invited him in. Everything inside was primitive, but the little lady brought him some dry clothes, which he recognized from a school trip to a folklore museum. She saw the boy's confusion and said we are elves, we are the hidden people, but don't worry, we won't do you any harm. After a hot meal, the lad fell asleep until morning, when the couple fed him and off he went. Unsure whether he dreamed at all, the lad followed his footsteps back in the snow, but the house had vanished. That boy is now 69 years old, lives in Reykjavik, and is just one of the 1,400 elf witnesses Magnus Skarfadinsson, headmaster of Iceland's elf school, has interviewed. I collect stories about paranormal experiences, ghosts and spirits, and while I've never seen them myself, I'm convinced that elves and hidden people, or Huldu folk, do exist, says Skarfadinsson, who has spent 34 years studying the phenomenon, meeting witnesses and collating their stories for his school, which he set up because so many locals and tourists would ask him about elves, knowing his fascination with the subject. According to him, elves and hidden people a bigger type of elf live and look much like humans. There are around 15 types of elves in Iceland. The smallest are the flower elves, at not much more than an inch, while hidden people can be up to three feet. I've met more than 900 Icelanders and 500 people from 40 other countries who claim to have seen elves and other nature spirits, says Skarfadinsson. And the only thing these people have in common is that they're psychic, they have a sixth sense. A 2007 study by the University of Iceland showed that 62% of Icelanders believe elves and hidden people exist. But you won't find gangs of rosy-cheeked imps roaming around the back streets of Reykjavik, they exist in a different dimension, and are only seen by those with psychic ability, of which an Iceland one in twenty claims to have such intuition. Icelanders have a deep friendship with the elves and hidden people, says Skarfadinsson. If somebody is lost in the wild, the hidden people would give them shelter. If people are starving, they will give them food. If they are sick, they will cure them. There are countless times the Icelandic people have been helped by the hidden people. But contrary to popular belief, Icelandic elves are not related to Santa's crew in the North Pole, although it is customary to leave food out for the hidden people on Christmas Eve. No, Christmas traditions in Iceland are generally reserved for the Yule lads. According to legend, Yule lads are a bunch of white boys, each with a different mischief, and a name like door slammer and spoon licker. From December 12 to 24, children leave their shoes by their windows, and, one by one, the 13 Yule lads come down from the mountains to leave presents in them, or old potatoes if they've been naughty. However, the elves do have a connection with New Year's Eve. It's when they move location, says Skarfadinsson. I've met people who have seen elves move house at midnight on New Year's Eve. It's also said elves make themselves visible to humans on Twelfth Night, and Icelanders celebrate this with a bonfire festival called Thorn Rattandon. The elf school is everything that is known about elves what they look like, where they live, and how this friendship has evolved through centuries, says Skarfadinsson. Popular with visitors from the US, Canada, the UK and Germany, he reckons more than 10,000 people have graduated from elf school since its founding. Open on Fridays only, the school day lasts four hours with a break for tea and pancakes, made from a special hidden people recipe, of course, and all elf students receive a certificate. Infused by Skarfadinson's abundant twinkly-eyed enthusiasm, we can only imagine anyone who comes away still cynical about elves is simply a cotton-headed ninny muggins. Number 5 off a stretch of empty West Texas Highway some 400 miles from Austin, crowds gather every night to experience the inexplicable. Come nightfall in Marfa, bright orbs of white, yellow, pink, blue, and red dance just above the horizon of the Chinati Mountains, twinkling, darting, hesitating, and disappearing back into the darkness of the Chihuahuan Desert. Some claim their UFOs. 
Others believe they're Mexican ghosts. Everyone just calls them the Marfalites. But what are they really, and why have people been wondering about them for more than a century? The first historical account of the Marfalites dates back to 1883. A cowhand named Robert Reed Ellison thought he was seeing the light of an Apache campfire in the distance. But upon investigation the next morning, there were no traces of humans. And ever since that fateful day, locals have been passing down eyewitness accounts of these glittering desert orbs. The once dying town of Marfa eventually embraced its local mystery, throwing the first Marfa Lights Festival in 1986 and erecting a Marfa Lights viewing platform in 2003. Now, thousands flock to this spot in El Despoblado to catch a glimpse of the strange phenomenon. Dig deep enough into Marfa's mythology and you'll find everything from legitimate academic studies to homespun websites in Comic Sans devoted to debunking the lights. In 2004 and 2008, teams from Utah, Dallas and Texas State, respectively, studied the perceived phenomenon. Both concluded that the Marfa lights could be explained by headlights off Highway 67 or small fires. When car headlights are seen through 15 miles or so of West Texas air that is unevenly heated by the ground, the light rays are bent and scattered slightly, so that the headlights are fuzzy and wavering, even when viewed through a telescope, explains Carl David Steffen, a professor in the Ingram School of Engineering at Texas State University. It's the same reason that stars twinkle. This bending and scattering also affects the light's perceived size, another tally in the column for everything's bigger in Texas. But, Stefan cryptically adds, the real Marfa lights are not headlights. Most locals you ask about the lights will give the same caveat. The usual Marfa lights are indeed car headlights, but somewhere around two dozen nights a year, the real Marfa lights show up. Tourists will spend hours watching headlights, and not just because they came on the wrong night. The official viewing platform seems to suggest looking straight at the highway. The real lights usually appear further east, dancing above the cacti on the desolate Mitchell Flats, away from the roadway. But if not headlights, which weren't exactly common, when this all started in 1883, then what? Multiple theories abound, with some insisting the Marfa lights are essentially ball lightning, stirred up by underground electrical energy. Others say swamp gas, aliens, or the ghosts of conquistadors. Nearly 140 years later, nobody actually knows. The viewing platform nine miles east of Marfa on US-90 is the go-to stop. Arrive there before the sun sets to get your bearings, note the faraway line of the Chinati Mountains, locate the radio tower, and study the highway. You won't be alone. Despite Marfa's remote location, the funky, artistic town of 1,700 attracts an outsized number of visitors and has a surprisingly good food scene. Alternatively, head out to the Shirley Ranch, 22 miles south of Marfa, where Mike Shirley invites travelers to gaze from his open land, where a hard-to-miss sign reads Starlight Gazing, Parking. Back in the one traffic light town, stay at the Hotel Pisano, where James Dean obsessed over the lights while filming Giant here in 1955. Dean, it's worth noting, tragically died shortly after leaving Marfa. Maybe he knew too much? Number 6 Are we alone in the universe? UFO hunting has always intrigued a handful of fanatics, but could there be definitive proof that aliens exist? Chile is one of the best countries to go looking for alien activity. The country has the highest number of annual UFO sightings, and the Chilean government has even launched CEFIT, Committee for Studies of Anomalous Aerial Phenomena. The Chilean Navy has released footage of a UFO sighting from 2014 that shows an unidentified object near the capital city, Santiago, and scientists are still baffled by the footage two years later. In the video, the object is seen discharging an unknown chemical into the air. It reportedly flew horizontally, and at the speed of a helicopter. The footage was captured by a naval helicopter on a routine coastal patrol in November 2014. When the technician spotted the mystery object, they zoomed in with infrared for better clarity. According to the Huffington Post, the pilots reported the object to air traffic controllers who confirmed there were no authorized planes flying in the area. They tried to communicate with the unknown object, but failed to receive a response. 
Weather balloons and low-flying planes were ruled out, and multiple agencies were contacted to verify whether any satellites or falling space debris could explain the object. General Ricardo Bermudez, director of Comite de Estudios de Fenomenos Aéreos Anomalos, CEFE, during the investigation, told the Huffington Post, We do not know what it was, but we do know what it was not. One theory of it being a medium-hull aircraft dumping cabin wastewater was debunked after Chilean authorities said it would have been cleared for landing at the airport and would have responded to radio communications. This has been one of the most important cases in my career as director of CEFA, because our committee was at its best, said General Bermudez. I am extremely pleased as well with the conclusion reached which is logical and unpretentious. The official conclusion was that the great majority of committee members agreed to call the subject in question a UAP, unidentified aerial phenomenon, due to the number of highly researched reasons that it was unanimously agreed, could not explain it. To this day, no one can confirm or deny the strange hovering object is proof of aliens, but this was the first time an unidentified object was caught on a high-quality video. The most common locations for UFO and alien sightings in Chile are found in the town of San Clemente, Cajun del Maipo, and in Ladrilato. Number 7 The faded decades-old black and white photograph was the only lead Johnny Isla had when he set out on the trail of a sea monster. The Peruvian archaeologist spotted the image at a 2014 exhibition in Germany about the Nazca Lines, the vast and intricate desert images which attract tens of thousands of tourists every year. The photograph taken in the early 1970s showed a mysterious killer whale deity carved in an arid hillside. The figure bore some resemblance to others he knew, but he had never seen this one before. Isla, now Peru's chief archaeologist for the lines, spent hours poring through archives before returning to Peru, armed with a drone and a lifetime of local field experience, to find it. After several false starts, it took just two weeks to find the 25 by 65 meter image which had been hiding in plain sight in the hills of Palpa, about 30 miles north of Nazca, in a huge expanse of desert in southern Peru. The design carved into the hillside depicts a terrifying mythological beast, part orca but with a human arm holding a trophy head and several more heads inside its body. New research with drones has helped uncover hundreds of such figures carved in the desert near the lines in Nazca, but which predate them by as much as 1,500 years. The archaeologists leading the effort now believe that the anthropomorphic orca figure fills in a missing link between hundreds of older geoglyphs and the Nazca culture's desert etchings. The smaller forms were etched on hillsides in nearby Palpa by the Paracas and Tapara cultures between 500 BC and AD 200. This orca was made at a time of abundance and population growth in a moment of change from one society to another, said Isla. Isla believed that the Tapara crafted the Orca figure during a period of dynamic transition. The Nazca lines are the culmination of a process of experimentation and improvement in technique which follow on from these older geoglyphs, said Isla. Dating from AD 200 to 700, the lines were given UNESCO World Heritage status in 1994. More than a thousand of them, vast geometric patterns, and zoomorphic figures such as the monkey, the hummingbird and the whale, stretch across more than 400 sq kilometers of the Nazca Plateau. They were created by removing the top layer of pebbles to reveal the lighter colored material beneath. The newly discovered geoglyph's location on hillsides, however, marks a key difference, said Luis Jaime Castillo, a Peruvian archaeologist working on the Nazca Palpa project with Isla. Placing these geoglyphs on the slopes means that, in contrast with the Nazca lines, you can see them, if you are standing in the valley below where life and agriculture is taking place, he said. If the Nazca lines were made by humans for the gods, these figures were made by humans for humans, explained Castillo, a former minister of culture for Peru. They are clearly representations of identifiable people. They are demarcating territories. By contrast, the larger and more sophisticated geoglyphs further south in Nazca cannot be viewed completely from the ground. According to Isla, the latest research indicates the Nazca lines were made with the purpose of asking the gods for water and fertility in this desert area.
But archaeologists are still trying to understand the transition between the Paracas culture's depiction of largely human figures intended to be viewed by other people to the Nazca iconography in which humans are all but absent. As the society grew larger the images may have been appropriated by the elite and given a sacred status, Castillo believes. It was a transition from drawings made by households or villages to grand designs made by an organization closer to a state, he argues. On one hillside, a warrior wearing a headdress and carrying a staff or spear stands close to a female figure. Between them is a mythological creature with a mass of tentacles or snakes. The figures are believed to symbolize fertility. From the ground, the designs are now hard to see. But the drone's eagle eye reveals the full design on a monitor viewed by Castillo, who has long promoted aerial mapping techniques to register Peru's estimated 100,000 archaeological sites, of which only a fraction have been excavated. Drones are being used, not just to find geoglyphs, but to cover kilometers and kilometers and take thousands and thousands of pictures, which are then processed in very large computers, Castillo said. The images are so detailed that we can see a stone half an inch across. The result of the process, known as photogrammetry, is highly detailed three-dimensional mapping of large areas, which in the case of the Nazca and Palpa lines is a huge boost for their protection. The funding to discover these new geoglyphs came, ironically, as a result of an international scandal, when Greenpeace activists left damaging footprints next to the famous hummingbird during a publicity stunt aimed at the 2014 UN Climate Change Summit in Lima. Outrage over the incident prompted the US to give Peru a grant which helped fund Isla and his team. Registering and geo-referencing the geoglyphs is the best way to protect them from the spread of agriculture or urban encroachment, Castillo says. But just a few of the sites will be made known to the public so as not to make them a target for vandalism. Many of the hillsides, cut through by the Pan American Highway, are already covered with modern-day etchings ranging from brands of fertilizer to graffiti tags. Castillo believes that in the Nazca and Palpa area, already described by UNESCO as having the most outstanding group of geoglyphs anywhere in the world, new discoveries may yet outnumber older ones. While the team have discovered hundreds of geoglyphs in Palpa, Castillo expects to find many more. We've registered maybe just 5% of what there is, he says. Number 8 On March 11, 2011, a devastating magnitude 9.1 earthquake rocked eastern Asia's seafloor, sending a wave of ocean water the height of a 12-story building into Japan's coast. More than 15,000 people lost their lives, millions lost access to running water or electricity, and more than 120,000 buildings were destroyed within a matter of minutes. The Tmoku earthquake, named for the region of northeastern Japan from which it originated, was the most devastating in the nation's recorded history. But shortly after the disaster, traumatized survivors began to see the faces of victims in puddles, wandering the beaches, and appearing at their doors. Disquieting figures drenched in water were also seen hailing cabs, only to disappear once they climbed into the back seat. And these weren't one-off sightings, residents all across the hardest-hit cities were reporting such apparitions. British reporter Richard Lloyd Perry explored the widespread phenomenon of these tsunami spirits in his non-fiction book, Ghosts of the Tsunami, and the bizarre circumstance was most recently chronicled in an episode of Netflix's Unsolved Mysteries. But explaining this eerie case has not been a simple task. One must consider how Japanese culture, collective grief, and perhaps the truly uncanny, work together to create these tsunami spirits. One thing is clear, however, these tales are as hair-raising as they are dumbfounding. It was 2.46 p.m. local time when the earthquake started. Centered 45 miles east of Tmoku at a depth of 15 miles below the surface of the ocean, it shook the earth for six full minutes, triggering 128-foot waves that crashed into Miyako City in northeastern Japan. Meanwhile, water traveled six miles inland in Sendai. A total of 217 square miles were flooded, which included the destruction of hospitals, schools, businesses, homes, railways, and everything else. Perhaps most devastatingly, 
The tsunami also caused a cooling system failure at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, leading to an infamous meltdown. Japan's reconstruction agency estimated that the financial damage reached $199 billion. The World Bank, meanwhile, estimated the total economic cost to be $235 billion. In the 65 years after the end of World War II, this is the toughest and the most difficult crisis for Japan, said then Prime Minister Naoto Kansas. But as Japan forged ahead with its reconstruction, the disaster lingered in supernatural ways. Richard Lloyd Perry had lived in Japan for 18 years by the time the natural disaster occurred, and he was surprised to learn that the nation was more superstitious than he thought. According to Perry, seeing a tsunami ghost in the months following the earthquake was not rare. People's grief and loss and anguish came out, he told NPR in 2014. And what also came out after a few months were stories of ghosts and hauntings and supernatural events to the extent that it almost seemed like an epidemic. In 2016, a graduate student of sociology named Yuka Kudo traveled to one of the cities most ravaged by the disaster, Ishinomaki, in order to study this epidemic. She focused specifically on the town's cab drivers, who claimed to have picked up passengers that turned out to be tsunami ghosts. The Shinomaki suffered 3,097 deaths and reported 2,770 missing persons. A whopping 50,000 buildings had been destroyed there as well. The decimated city saw most of its population relocate, with aimless cab drivers hoping for the best on their shifts. Out of the 100 cabbies Kudo prodded for supernatural stories, seven volunteered. The first cabbie told Kudo of an encounter he had in the summer of 2011. It had only been a few months since the tsunami, and there were barely any customers. He was naturally shocked to suddenly spot a young woman hailing him down in a particularly hard-hit area. Wearing a heavy winter coat in the middle of summer, the figure was also completely drenched. The driver barely had time to realize that it hadn't trained in days before she climbed into the back seat and asked to be driven to the largely abandoned Manamahama district. That area is almost empty, he said while switching on the meter. Are you sure? There was a long silence. Then, in a shivering voice, the woman asked, have I died? The terrified driver turned around to face the customer, but found absolutely nothing nor anyone in his car. Another cabbie told Kudo that he picked up a confused-looking man in his twenties who kept pointing forward when asked where he needed to go. Finally, he said simply, Hiyoriyama a mountain park near the city. After careening up the mountain near Ishinomaki, the driver dropped his customer on a plateau at the summit. But when he turned around to be paid, there was nobody in his car. Perry's investigative book also documents how one man in Kurahara said that he now despises the rain as he constantly sees the eyes of tsunami victims he knew in the puddles. The ghost of an old woman is said to haunt a refugee home in Onagawa and to have regularly sat down for a cup of tea there. The cushion that would be left out for her was purportedly soaked in seawater every time her visits were over. And in Tagajm, one fire station received incessant calls until the firefighters drove to the caller's ruins to pray for the dead. Then, the calls stopped completely. But there were more profound incidences with tsunami ghosts than these. Perry also spoke with Buddhist priest Reverend Taiyo Kanita, who told him about a man named Takashi Ono, who had become possessed. Kanita and Ono both lived miles from the coastline, where the worst of the disaster had occurred. While Kanita helped countless people properly bury their loved ones, Ono stayed away from the disaster zone until he finally went on his own to face it months later. After seeing the monumental loss and devastation along the beaches, he returned home and had dinner with his family. Afterwards, he went into the backyard and started rolling in the mud, speaking in a guttural, aggressive way. His family was mortified. The next day, he had no recollection of what he had done. While there are no clear-cut answers to these incidents, perhaps a closer look at the history of Japan's relationship with the spirit realm can provide some insight into these tsunami ghosts. Japan has had a long-standing cultural relationship with ghosts, or ikre. In the Shinto religion, which means literally the way of the gods and is the indigenous faith of the Japanese people, spirits inhabit all things animate and inanimate. 
Many Japanese came to believe that because the tsunami took people before they were ready to die, their restless spirit still wanders the plane of reality. And despite global polls suggesting that Japan is one of the least religious nations on the planet, Perry has come to learn otherwise. I hadn't realized how real and alive the cult of the ancestors and the cult of the dead is Perry reported. The other thing I learned is something I should have known anyway, but that grief and trauma express themselves often very indirectly. Perry believes that Ono is one such example of this. Even though Kanita performed an exorcism on him, as well as many others who believed they were possessed by tsunami spirits, Perry is unconvinced that the supernatural is really behind this phenomenon. But he did agree with Kanita on the principle that these spirits are real to whomever believes to have seen them, and in that context, should be taken seriously. He never said to me that he didn't believe them he said what matters is that people believe in them said Perry. It doesn't really matter whether you believe in ghosts. What's real is the suffering and the pain. Perry theorizes that the widespread phenomenon of tsunami ghosts is likely the manifestation of a nation processing its collective trauma and grief. Coastal towns across Japan have indeed found other creative ways to grieve. For instance, the town of Itsuchi installed a phone booth called Phone of the Wild, atop a hill overlooking the ocean, that allows those in mourning to send messages to their loved ones in another realm. Dr. Charles R. Figley of the School of Social Work at Tulane University confirmed that trauma shared by the masses often produces strange collective reactions. It is not uncommon for fellow survivors of catastrophic loss and dislocation to have common reactions, be they paranormal sightings, sounds, or smells, he said. Ghosts, for some, are more tolerable than the void created by death.